And so I just always been around white people and I never felt I never felt weird around them until they make it like weird. I didn't experience racism until I was about eight. Mm, and that mm-hmm. was from like an Asian woman and then a Mexican lady. So white people, I've been okay with it. wasn't really until t- the 2016 election that I started to see the white side of my family a lot differently. <laughs> Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney Lee. I'm your host and I'm here today with Kendra, who is the podcast host of Crushgasms. Crushgasm. Crushgasm. Mm -hmm. One gasm. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I met her via, I think Instagram. Um, and we just started connecting. I was actually on her podcast recently talking about my elementary school crush. It's a very interesting podcast, lots of fun. And, um, Kendra had mentioned some stuff about imposter syndrome and I was like, well, why don't you come on the show? So here we are. I am happy to have you, Kendra. Can you introduce yourself with your name and the identities that you're bringing to this conversation? Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm Kendra. Like you said, host of Crushgasm. Um, Imposter syndrome for me, I've experienced it in the way that I guess I just, I was like an honor roll student. And I think, you know, you have high expectations for what your life's going to be. And then you get in the real world and there's no grades and they don't treat you the same way that they do in school. So I've had this imposter syndrome of what I should have done in life versus what I have done. And then in writing as a freelancer, um, just the... I guess the they're always playing on, well, you're black, so you have to write about this, or you're black, so you can't write about this. And I grew up uh, very emo, very in that MySpace pop punk scene. So being black in that in the early 2000s, there's a lot of imposter syndrome. You feel like you shouldn't be there. And as, as a woman who doesn't want to just sleep with everybody, you just really just – I'm trying to get free tickets to a concert. Please just right. let me interview you. <laughs> so in, in, the, in various ways. Mm-hmm. And so what racial identities are you? I am Black, Spanish, and German-Irish. Okay. And you have beautiful hair. Um, you. <laughs> if you're not watching, if you're just listening, Kendra's got these like beautiful um, French braids that <laughs> just look great. Okay. So um, you said a lot there that I can really relate to. I was also pretty emo as a adolescent and also grew up during the MySpace times where you could change your music whenever you wanted to and the music would always be something that was either yelling at you or something that made you (laughs) want to cry. And I listened to some pop rock, um, which was very out of the norm for the environments that I was in, at least as far as when I was in black spaces. And I definitely remember feeling different. I like to skateboard. That was very strange (laughs) for people (laughs) who looked like me. And I remember skateboarding one day down the street and I was trying to do a trick and my softball coach happened to have been driving his car down the street and saw me like completely wipe out. And it was the most embarrassing thing. And so he stopped and he rolled down his window and was like, I don't know, made some smart comment and was laughing um, and then drove on. It's like, oh, rude. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. You mentioned that you're a freelance writer um, and you also work in schools, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm a instructional aide in a pre-K class in a school that's pre-K through eighth grade. So, that's yeah. <laughs> we have the littlest ones. <laughs> That's cute. That's real cute. Mm -hmm. I bet they're cute. (laughs) Oh, they're all so – they're so adorable, but they have a a bad side. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so let's start with your um, – I'm going to call it your traditional job as an aide in the classroom. How did you get there? Were you – when you went to school, did you want to be a teacher? Did you want to be with kids? 
No, after college, I, I went to school just to move away. Mm. I had no plans. They're like, you know, when you're on a roll or advanced class, they're always pushing college towards you, especially of our generation. I think millennials are the last ones to kind of get that push. And they were always like, well, you got to go. That's your that's your trail to glory, your path to success. So I went, but they really don't tell you much else. Once you get there, it's such a big university. Your counselors, you don't even see these people unless you seek them out. So you're kind of just like thrown in. And then I came from a family that does not do higher education. I was the first to really graduate mm -hmm. on time, not, you know, and then was it like when you go to the adult ed or something like that? Yeah. So I was first to graduate, first to go off to college. So my mom was no help at all. I didn't know how to do the FAFSA at all. I had to call my high school counselor to be like, how do I do FAFSA when I was in college? Because so, I couldn't reach anyone at the university. And I go and I have no clue what I want to major in. I'm just taking all those stupid general ed classes that just cost money for no reason. And then I got to be a junior and they're like, you have to declare a major. And I was like, okay, well, what do I have the most credits towards? And they're like, humanities. I was like, I don't know what that is, but let's go for it. And then I ended up doing that. And then when I graduated, lost even more so. Because you're like, what do I do with humanities? Right. What even is that? Yeah, It's such a made-up thing. And so I started writing. But, you know, I do like my little side hustles. And I wound up working at a private school in uh, Los Angeles that was like ritzy ditzy. I was doing their, I was just proctoring their AP exams and like mm. SATs, ACTs. So I was in a school setting. And that helped me when we were planning to leave Virginia. I was like, well, what do I want to do? And so I just applied to Columbus City Schools on a whim. And I think COVID, the pandemic, a lot of educators left. They need a lot more. And I got hired. I was like, I'm not going to be there for like two months. And they were like, it's okay. We'll hold the position. <laughs> and then I got there and now I'm in a pre-K class. And I kind of, I love it. I love being in school. I think it's that like oh. my past is like a nerd. Yeah. I just love school settings. I'm just like comfortable in them. And Columbus is a very heavily uh, black population. I'm on the west side and it comes, it's a lot of lower income students, which I mm -hmm. grew up broke as a joke. And mm -hmm. so I'm really comfortable. There's no imposter syndrome in the pre-K, like, cause there's a lot of, my dad's always like, are there people like us? Like he always has to ask wherever I live. He's like, are we there? And I'm like, dad, it's crazy. There's only four white kids in this class of 19. The rest are black or Hispanic. And he's like, wow. So I feel really cool being like, you can tell when the little like black girls are like, Miss B, Miss B. Like they get all excited yeah. to talk to you. Cause I didn't have, I was thinking about this. I didn't have a black teacher until I think college. Wow. Yeah, I had a sub in elementary. That's how much it stands out. I had one sub, black sub in elementary. None in – yeah, none in – maybe like one or two subs in middle, but none that stick out. And then there was a black English teacher, but I didn't have her. I had the white one. <laughs> nice. Where did, and where did you grow up going to school? Banning, California. Um, near – it's like an hour or so from Palm Springs before you hit Palm Springs. Okay, okay. Near like Coachella and stuff. Yeah. So I grew up in Seattle. We, um, I had, I did have black teachers in elementary school, but they were older. And in general, I don't remember teachers being young, period. No. Um, and I went to a couple of, I went to a couple of schools in middle school. So I was very different from you. I was not the good student. I was the student mm -hmm. that like was sent to the guidance counselor and was in like the guidance counselor program. And at the time when you're a kid, you're like, I'm special. I get to go shoot rockets in the, you know, on the playground with the guidance counselor. But as an adult, it's, you look back and you realize it's because you were a problem child. And um, that was their way of, I don't know, maybe doing some kind of child therapy. I don't know. Anyways, so um, I went to a lot of schools in middle school because I, got kicked out. Um, and at one point I went to an all black school, which was very interesting, um, that had black teachers and they were younger. Um, and then, yeah, through high school, I had one black teacher who was also an English teacher. Um, her name was Miss Alacalaro. And that was it. And in college, I frankly, I do not remember black teachers. Um, yeah, college yeah, is I like. Had one. I had one. 
um, Professor White, who was on my podcast actually in season one. Um, so yeah, that's really cool that you're in an environment where young students recognize basically mm -hmm. like the importance of having people that look like them and also that they can relate to you um, because you look like them and you, you mirror them. I also so, dress like them. I just very childlike. So, <laughs> so I'm very bright. Very, I, I look like a modern day Miss Frizzle sometimes. I'm just yes, like, let's Ms. wear flowers. <laughs> let's wear flowers. It was spirit week last week. So I had a lot of fun with the read across America themes. <laughs> Oh, I bet you did. And you've got like glitter. So if you're again, if you're not watching, Kendra's got glittery glasses that yeah. got multiple colors in them. Very. I feel like you would be like the cool teacher, basically. I I'm one of the. I'm the youngest uh, eight. I'm the youngest in the classroom, but um, we all dress like pretty young. The other, the part time age, she's black too, and then the teacher's uh, white. But we just keep it cool for all the students. But yeah, yeah. it's cool to do that, and it's cool that they get to be around. People that look like uh, you went to uh, like uh, one black school. I went to a school that was pretty diverse, but being my personality of being what they call like you're too you're too white is what they call mm -hmm. me. Another that's a whole other bag to open of imposter mm -hmm. syndrome of race. But uh, I had my group was pretty diverse. We had every race in our group because I feel like we were the kids that didn't fit into the others. Like we had Native yep. American, Indian from India. Asian, Mexican, white. Black. So we were like this little United Nations because we just didn't fit in. But it's not like anyone ever made me feel bad about it. Like my first friend in school was a little black girl named Tatiana. And then another black girl came in elementary. We're the only three black kids in our elementary school from K through fifth. Maybe a black kid would oh. pop in and out. But for our grade, we were together until we went to the middle school where there's more black kids and they found, you know, cooler people to hang out with. And I was like, that's okay. I remember. That's so cool. when I went to the black school, I was frequently called an Oreo. I don't mm -hmm. know if you were, yeah, black mm -hmm. on the outside, white on the Oreo, inside. Oreo, um, coconut. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Because, um, yeah, I always got the you are – well, I talk white is what I was told. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't I don't know what you want from me, but fine. Because, like, I'm clearly black and I don't necessarily fit in in these white spaces, but okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a whole thing. But so as far as your freelance career goes, mm -hmm. what is that like as far as dealing with imposter syndrome? Is that a space where you do feel imposter syndrome? I do on some level because I don't have a lot of like self-esteem for my writing. Like I've been doing it since 2010. So it's like, well, you must wow. be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you must be good at it if you keep getting hired for things. But I'm not at the level of where I think I should be. And I think it's sometimes because I'm not – like I see some writers where like they're, they just interviewed Beyonce for like Essence. And I'm like maybe I'm not with Essence because I'm not – black enough like for mm. some sites they're like oh for black history do this this and this and you're like that's cool but I feel like I don't have a lot of those experiences to take them to the next level mm -hmm. like I can only write from my own like mixed experience and there's really no space for that in the world mm. except for like on Kenya Barris's shows where he really pushes mixed dish and what black AF or whatever. <laughs> so just yeah. for that and the type of spaces I started out in, I started in music and being a black female in like the pop punk going to like backstage at Warp Tour. It's like you stick out like a sore thumb and I'm always like kind of cowering too because I don't have that like extroverted personality to own the space as well. I think that's it. Interesting. So my – Okay, so we're recording this in March, and this month, a lot of my shows are about Black women and um, how Black women are treated as far as stereotypes and racism and the intersectionality of racism and sexism. So one of the um, one of my guests, we spoke about the TV show Harlem. I don't know if you've watched it. Mm -mm. Um, okay. So it's basically like a girlfriend's or a sex in the city, but okay. with black people. Mm -hmm. And my guest, though, is a biracial woman who identifies as biracial. And we were talking about blackish and we were talking about Bo and Bo's family and how when her family saw Bo's family, they finally felt like they saw 
representation of themselves in media. And I hear you talking a little bit about that, about how our identities can kind of define in a lot of ways which spaces we're welcome into and which spaces we're not, Mm -hmm. even on, even when we're writing. Like when I think about writing and freelance work, I think about creativity. And I think about like wanting diverse perspectives and experiences and Mm -hmm. not wanting to give the same perspective every single time. But it sounds like you're very much so experiencing that there are kind of requirements or expectations depending on what your uh, background is racially, but also culturally, Mm -hmm. and what you're reporting or writing on. Is that right? Yeah, I feel like once they know you're black, they're going to be like, oh, do you want to do this for black? Like Black History Month, huge month for black freelancers because they are like, let's get these out. You know, mm-hmm. what's the hood like? And you're like, didn't didn't grow up in that. I grew up poor, but in a trailer park situation, not the <laughs> hood. So, yeah, I feel like once they know you have, they kind of think that's your perspective. But just because you're black doesn't mean you have the same perspective as someone who, like, you grew up in Seattle or someone who grew up, you know, X, Y, Z. So I feel like stop putting that on us, you know, just because I, I'm I have the same melanin as you doesn't mean I have the same life as you. So please, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know you were talking about humanities, which as we know, is one of those majors like English where it's just kind of like, I mean, I enjoyed it, but like, what do I do with it? My sister, I've talked about this before, uh, majored in English and had like a whole, I would call it a crisis. I don't know what she would call it, but like when you graduate, similar to what you're saying, and then you're like, oh shit, okay. uh, What do I do with this? Right, right. Other than being an English teacher. (laughs) Right, and she's someone – Similar to you, like she loves art, she loves writing, she loves drawing, and our society does not encourage that as a profession because mm-hmm. of the perception that it we don't you can't make money. And since our society is so heavily focused on making money, it's kind of like why would you do something that doesn't make you money? Mm-hmm. Um, but I digress. So I can definitely understand where imposter syndrome would come in for you if you're somebody. One, so I heard several things, that you're a first-generation um, graduate and college student, at least in the mm-hmm. traditional sense, and that you graduated with this degree that you weren't sure what you were going to do with, and you're going into you know freelance writing at a time and in a space where, as a person of color, you're expected to write about certain things that you mm-hmm. are feeling like you don't have the personal experience to actually be able yes. to write about. You missed out on opportunities too. You're like, <laughs> yeah, and that was going to be one of my questions around like, how does the imposter syndrome that you do experience, or the self doubt, or being treated like an imposter? Because frankly, you know, I think a lot of what you're experiencing is just other people saying, "Well, you don't fit into the mm-hmm. box that we want you to fit in." So, um, you know, no, <laughs> no to you, or you know be something different or do something different or do this anyways. And uh, I wonder if there have been opportunities that you've passed up on or did not even put yourself out there for um, because of imposter syndrome or this like feeling of self-doubt or Mm -hmm. feeling like I know that they're going to want me to write about this and I don't have that experience. Yeah, I have friends that I'll be on the lookout because I know like going to job boards, especially for freelance, isn't really like we use Twitter X or whatever. And you'll see like editors be like, oh, if you're this, this and this and you have this experience, can you, will you pitch us? And you're always like, I have this, this and but not that. So mm-hmm. you kind of just are like, why even put my hat in the ring when I know I can't do my best for you because mm-hmm. you want like the black experience not so much my experience with something or if it's like TV shows that are, you know, more centered towards black folks, but yeah, I don't care what I watch as long as it's a good show. But sometimes like for insecure, I just love the show, but as like a black powerful woman, I couldn't relate to Molly in any way. Like I related Mm -hmm. to Issa, but not because I'm a black woman, just because like I feel the struggle of just adulthood, but Mm -hmm. they kind of want the, well, because you're a black woman, what's it like? But it's like, I don't know. I just, it sucks. It's adulthood sucks. Yeah, for everybody. 
<laughs> Can't we please be teenagers? Um, I, or I would better be 12 yet. For- <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, not teenagers, younger than teenagers. Uh, Before puberty, because yeah. <laughs> puberty just, it messes you up. <laughs> I'd like to be nine. <laughs> Innocent. I feel like that's your last year of innocence, nine. You're just like, oh, my God, the world's so nice. Like I hear these pre-K kids talk all the time, and I'm like, to be that naive and that just like, oh, just bright-eyed to the world. I I think that's why I like that class too, (laughs) that age. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sad by what you're saying because we're not a monolith, obviously, Mm -hmm. black people, and – I don't know. I mean, like I said at the beginning, like I think people should want our different perspectives. And I don't think that that should be something that um, excludes us from being able to share our perspectives Mm -hmm. because like, I don't know, I guess I'm trying to, in my mind, kind of relearn what it means to be a black person for me. Uh, because I have spent so much of my life comparing myself to other Black people and being told that I am an Oreo or being told that I'm not Black enough um, because basically I don't share the experience of what mainstream society has portrayed as Black. So growing up in the ghetto, um, speaking Ebonics or other forms of, you know, how we speak culturally or, you know, having some, even as far as pop culture goes, like having some of those shared memories around TV shows that like I never watched um, or other information or knowledge that it's assumed that all black people have. Mm -hmm. But of course we don't because we're all different and grew up uh, in different spaces So it's interesting to me um, to learn more and more about what this looks like in media, whether it's TV shows or writing. Um, So what have you done? What's worked for you in terms of getting past that imposter syndrome? I think just focusing more on, as in freelance, just what I know and what I can bring to like a different website. Like, I've coined myself as like a little 90s expert, a little millennium girly. So that's kind of the avenue. I kind of stray from anything that's race-based because I'm like, I just want to have fun and write about like Lizzie McGuire and why that show was the best thing ever. Or I want to write a list about, you know, Furbies or Tamagotchis. Like I go more like general millennial than race-based now as much as I can. Like if someone needs me, like I did my friend's podcast an evening at the movies for Black History Month and I chose Crooklyn because I feel like that is a movie that that is Spike Lee's like Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown, the best that they've done, but because it's a black woman or female as the lead, it's going to get pushed down. So I did talk about that, but I felt like I couldn't bring enough to it because it's a black family and I grew up in a mixed family. So, but on that level, I do try to stray away from race as much as I can, not like purposely. If like I want to talk about it, I will, but I try to stay like pop culture, 90s, what I know, Mm -hmm. what I'm good at. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But you also know about your experience. Mm-hmm. You know, I do love op-eds. So if like anything pops up that I'm pretty sure I can do, I'll do it because I don't, I don't like to like pitch something. And the worst is as a freelancer is pitching it and being like, I can do this. And then like the getting it approved and being like, I can't do this. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're like, oh, what did I get myself into? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's as a consultant responding to uh, RFPs, which are, I guess, requests for production or projects or something. I don't know what the P stands for. Mm -hmm. Um, But like writing up this master plan, you know, and then getting it and then being like, all right, okay, all right, we're going to do this. Uh, It is, (laughs) it's a moment for sure. Um, So, I mean, what about the white? part of you, your the whiteness in your identity. Do you find similar kind of um I want to say exclusion. I don't know if that's the right word. I grew people are always like, oh you're black. And they I think they just they're like, well she's so white she must have grew up more white. My mom's looks Native American. She's Spanish and white as well. So she's mixed too. Mm. Um 
but she leans more brown. So I grew up more attached to my Spanish side, but my older Ooh. brother is white and Hispan- is Spanish and he looks more white. So I grew up around him and his like metalhead friends. He looked like Wayne from Wayne's World in the <laughs> 90s and he did have a friend that looked like Garth, so it was pretty cool. And so I just always been around white people and I never felt – I never felt weird around them until they make it like weird. I didn't experience racism until I was about eight. Mm, And that mm -hmm. was from like an Asian woman and then a Mexican lady. So white people, I've been okay with. It wasn't really until the 2016 election that I started to see the white side of my family a lot differently. (laughs) We'll see that. I was like, huh interesting. Yeah, yeah. How can you love me and my brother, my who's my only full brother in life, and then or, – or my little, like, nephew who looks like little brown boy, little Hispanic boy because his mom is Mexican. And I'm like, you can love us. You say you love us, but how could you support something that clearly does not love us? Right. Does <laughs> not love us, us. Does not want us to thrive. Does not – Yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah, barely I, started talking to one relative again because um, I, I, I'm hoping she's changed her ways. But mm-hmm. We're going to find election. out. Yeah, well, we'll see when she starts posting things. Yeah, yeah. We're going to find out election. real quick. Yeah. <laughs> as far as the schooling goes and – And I mean, you're um, being an aide in classrooms, and it sounds like that's a place that you're really comfortable, and so you're not really dealing so much with imposter syndrome. Do you feel as though your unique perspectives, you know, that is a place where you can shine as far as bringing all of your experience and, you know, all of the cultures that you, that are involved in your upbringing? Yeah, I think just being like somebody that is like older than them and in this like leadership role for these little black kids is like huge. Like you said, to see the representation at that, like your first time in school is going to set them up for being like, okay, I belong here. There's people like me here. I also know what they're going through financially, like in their homes, if they Mm. don't come, because our kids don't, like some of them, not all of them, come from homes that aren't the greatest. I didn't come from a home that was picture perfect. So if they come in a little, like acting a little different or something, I know that's probably because maybe they didn't eat last night. Maybe mom was doing something she shouldn't have been. So I feel like I... I relate to them on multiple levels, racially mm. and economically. And also, I, I'm i one of those adults that I never forget what it's like to be those ages. I hate – my favorite quote is like from Perks of Being a Wallflower. It's like, you know, when you're 16, you turn 17, you forget what it's like to be 16. I never forget about what every age is. Like my husband's like, how do you remember when you were four and five? I'm like – how do you not like how do you not remember your first day of kindergarten and feeling so nervous and then making that first friend so i also relate to them on that cuz i know what they're feeling i don't remember it's, any it's of interest- I, it's so interesting to see them like have little clicks and just like <laughs> you know, the how mean girls get started it's it's wild to watch i love i think he i don't like people i'm not like a social person but i Mm -hmm. think people are the most interesting creatures we can study on earth and that's what i do every day i'm like hmm, like it's just wild to watch at four and five years old Hmm. Ugh, ugh. so (laughs) sorry i'm saying that because my kids are that age you know and i'm just like i couldn't imagine being around a bunch of them (laughs) every single day I know uh, my husband comes – I come home and he's like asking me questions. I'm like, stop. You don't know all – it's 19 of them being like, Miss B, why? Why this? What's that? Oh, my God. But, and you're like, shh, shh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. They don't care if you're listening or not. They're just going to continue to talk at you uh, mm-hmm. until you engage with them. So, yeah, that seems exhausting to me. Um, it is, but it's fun. <laughs> And you mentioned I'm I'm always curious about how honors and AP classes like how that feels when you are a person of color, and maybe it doesn't feel any different. But like for me in high school, again, I was not in AP or honors classes. I'm a twin though, and my twin sister was, oh. so we didn't have classes together because she was in the smart classes, I was in the regular people classes. And um, 
we were two of, I don't know, maybe 15 people of color in the school, even less black people. And I imagine she was, maybe there were two people in her AP classes, like her and one other person of color. Um, But I just wonder whether you noticed that as a student who's matriculating through these, you know, advanced classes that are highly competitive um, and where maybe people have different resources than you do and how, you know, what you experienced going through that. Um, well, they, they tested me for gate, the gifted and talented, whatever, in like second or third grade. So they knew pretty early on, this one's one of the, the good ones. Let's get mm-hmm. her in there. But they, my school district wasn't the best. So it's not like we had more. And I didn't really notice race playing a part into it until I got to middle school. Cause we, in elementary school, you're just with all the other kids, you know, right. you're just yeah. like, whatever. But middle school, they put me in advanced classes and I was with two other black girls and one, one, yeah, one, I'm going to say one black boy. And we kind of from sixth to eighth grade stayed together. There's no, Mm. once you're in that smart class, they kind of lumped you, herded you together through middle school. And I did notice like a race thing played into it until we got to, I want to say seventh or eighth. And they were like women in STEM, colored women in STEM. And they Mm -hmm. sent the three of the black girls and then the I think one or two Hispanic girls off for the day. And I was like, I hate math and science. I was like, why are they? and I it was just the five of us. So I was like, this is a race thing. They want yeah. us to I don't think any of us went into math or science. If I'm thinking <laughs> of all the one's real estate, one's a mom, one's one went into science. She's like does environmental stuff. So Oh, maybe cool. it, helped, it helped her, but the rest of us, that was the only time I felt like race played a part. And in high school, we have two middle schools in our district. So they funnel us into one high school mm. and that's where it kind of broadened. We got a little bit more, but they're from the other school. So I didn't really click with them too much. <laughs> but race though, because of our school district not being the best, we didn't have more opportunities than anybody else in the school. It was just like, interesting. here's your, you're in a different class and let's take, I feel, we didn't, I feel like only the only person to pass the AP exam was like the other mixed black girl in the class. She ended up, she, who was our valedictorian. Who's the mm. environmentalist? She's super. Oh, good for her. Super smart. Yeah. So other than that, like our, our school was not doing what AP should be doing. But when I was doing the AP test at the um, fancy private school, proctoring them, that school almost, I think a lot of their black students were poached from other schools for athlete, for athletics. Yep. Or like, I mentioned Blackish Kenya Bears. His daughter went to that school. That's what kind of school this was. It was mm. for people that could pay the tuition of however much it takes. So, and then in my exams, I feel like I didn't have that many black kids, that many brown kids uh, in those AP exams. It was like very white, very, you know. Yeah, I think I that's what like I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of AP classes. And it's, I, I think from my perspective, as someone who did go to private school. So the the AP classes that my sister were in were in a private Catholic school. Mm-hmm. And most of the families, like we grew up middle class. I think probably most of the families were middle to upper class. And I could tell like class seemed to be a bigger thing. Mm-hmm. Um, than race in some respects because Mm -hmm. it was something that was actually talked about. Whereas Mm -hmm. race, it was still one of those, like black people talked about it, people of color talked about how there were not other people of color, but there weren't a lot of conversations going on around the school, around race or lack of diversity. But when it came to how much you were spending on something or what kind of car the junior Um received for their birthday or what kind of shoes you were wearing or whether or not you had a job, whether or not you could afford a parking spot at the school um, or if you were taking the bus, that type of thing were things that that were talked about. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I had 
friends who are in the public school system who are taking AP classes. And some of the more inner city schools, of course, had more students of color um, and people who are in the AP classes, but other schools that were in the suburbs having less people of color. And I think, you know, that's just a pattern that we see throughout the United States around our education system. And certainly I'm seeing that now as a parent who's, you know, I have one son um, who's autistic and another son who's not and learning more about the various gifted and talented programs. Um, and just really, you know, for me, I've been paying a lot of attention to who is getting the resources for these programs, whether it be, um, you know, people of color who are being excluded or not, or people with more financial means who are, are getting um, advantage or who are getting to take advantage, I guess, of those types of, of programs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm curious because I can't believe you've been writing. So you've been freelancing for 14 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And it's like music, TV, pop culture, op-ed, like my resume is like this, this is a, it's a wild pattern. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So what are your goals? I would love to write a book about something. I'm hope I want to write, uh, there's like a few books I have in my head that I hope I can write. They're usually pop culture based. And then I write for the, I've written for this one lady since 2015. And I, when we would go to lunch, I would tell her stories of my life because I grew up like trailer trash. And she's like, these are so, like, they shouldn't be funny, but they're so funny. You should write about that. So I do have that in mind as well. Cause I think just like, Cause you think I, that's my other thing is like, I, my favorite genre of film is coming of age. And when they're mm. black, they're always like, let's make it about their blackness, which is yeah. the most, that's why I love Crooklyn because it's, they have the black aspects of it, but it's about a family. It's about a girl growing up, losing her mom. And I like, I want to write that coming of age story where it's a black girl, but she's not in the ghetto. She's not like the only black kid at this school. It's just her life. And then she's just existing. Like when you watch, like perks of being a white wallflower. It's not about him being white or love Simon, things like that. Or well, yeah, I mean, any know, white show. Day, yeah, right. it's just like they get to, I think Issa Rae said it, they get to just exist while when you're black or Hispanic or Asian, we have to put our race as the core thing of the issue of the show or the movie. It's like, no, I'm just living my life just like you. Like, you know, I have my ups and downs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a, yeah. one of my goals as well in writing. Mm. That would be awesome. Um, Books, yes. And my pipe dream, SNL. <laughs> really? Could last, no. Could I last a week? No, I'm reading Kenan Thompson's book right now and how stressful it, his first mm – -hmm. I think he didn't really feel like he fit in, speaking of imposter syndrome, till his third season. Wow. Third season. So it's, it's a pressure cooker in there. <laughs> but I would love to write, like, skits. Mm-hmm. Sketches. Mm-hmm. Well, you'll get there. You'll get there. Oh, to me, it's like, it's amazing that you've hung in there for so long, you know, and that you're able to build like a career. I think for someone, okay, so I am not, I am unfamiliar with the freelance life. Um, like, I don't know what that's like. And am recently kind of learning more about entrepreneurship and my own journey. Uh, but it's amazing to me that people figure out a way to financially sustain themselves doing things long term, <laughs> right? Like whatever it is that they, that they do long term. And I think that that in and of itself is like a victory that should be celebrated that like you, you enjoy writing and you do write and you've, it's a career for you. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, think that's it's awesome. I just love it. I mean, I fell into it because after college, my dad's like, I'm not going to pay for you to go to concerts anymore. And I was like, oh, what? Oh, my God. So and then when I worked with this one lady at a radio promotions company, I was doing CD reviews for her, and she's like, you know, you're really good at this. You could try to like interview people and like get press passes. And that's how it started. And then just from there, I was like, how could I grow on this? And people are like, it's not a real job. And I'm like, yes, it is. 
I, I get money and I don't ask you to pay my rent. So calm down. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap up here in a second, but I want you to tell us a little bit about your podcast for folks who are oh. interested. Well, Crush Gasm is like my favorite thing in life is like a slumber party <laughs> and talking about people you like. And I was like, how do I make a show out of this? And I was like, what do we all have in common? The, our baseline crushes. Everyone has a crush, whether it's like on a fictional character or a real person. And I was like, let's bring that. And then I, I named it. My husband was podcasting for about um, a few months or something before I was like, well, he could do it. <laughs> like, like I interview people all the time via email. Let's just use my voice this time. So I was like, let's do it. So people come on like yourself and they talk about a specific crush they've had in life. And you did elementary school, which is such a big, that's our first crush. Come mm -hmm. on. And I've had just been going since 2021 now. And it's just really fun. People come on, they talk about a crush. We talk about themselves and I just love it. Mm. I love it. So what's your favorite like crush story of like your personal crushes? Oh, God. I'm always going to go to middle school. I think like elementary school is cute, but middle school is where like the hormones are going and you're it's just real. so confused. It's about, real, real. Yeah. yeah. Every, like that is the love of your life. They'll never know it. And of course, I look back and I'm like, he wasn't even that cute. He was like, not at all. We're friends today on Facebook, and he has a life that I could never even want, like mm -hmm. kids and the family and all mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, not for me. So I'm glad it didn't work out. <laughs> I'm glad he never gave me the time of day. But I love middle school ones. I had a singer on, and she talked about a middle school and liking that. Like, she was totally like goody goody, and he was like that rebel skater, like mm -hmm. back and like. Her just being like, do you want a pencil? And it was such a cute, like, story. I love that story. <laughs> I love middle school. I think that's my favorite era of, like, human life because everybody's confused. Everyone's going through the same thing, whether you're the popular girl or the loser. You're, st you're, you're all stressing about the stupidest things, and it's amazing. And I wish we could bond more over that at the time instead of, like, years down the line when you're like, oh, you were miserable too. That's cool. I wish we knew then. I wish they – have you ever watched Big Mouth on Netflix? No. It's an animated series that goes over everything we're going through like mentally. Like it, it puts a – it personifies our emotions like shame and oh, um, cool. our hormones. There's, they have hormone monsters. They're all going through puberty. And I feel like while it gets really risque at times, it would be a perfect show to show kids once they hit like 12 years old so mm. they can understand – you're not alone. Everybody's humping everything right now. You're scared. <laughs> You're horny. It's like, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, man. Hormone monsters. Amen to that. I feel like My hormone monsters. <laughs> right. I feel like hormone monsters for women just never go away. Like that is just, that's the, the thing on the shoulder for the rest of life. Well, until menopause, maybe. Um, are the they, they cover monsters. that too. The adults in the show, their parents, they get their own little personalities in their head too. And we we saw a uh, menopause uh, come to life. It's just a, a beautiful show for like okay. psych psychological reasons, and uh, it, it helps heal your your like twelve year old self. I need to watch that. My twelve year old self definitely needs healing. And definitely. that was my least character. favorite year in life. 12. Twelve years old. Yeah. They have they have a mixed girl too. Her name is nice. Missy, and she's amazing little nerd in overalls. I love her, and she she has the same hair. <laughs> Big deal. Nice, mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, so last question. Tell us what the mantra or affirmation that you really rely on during the season. What is that? During like the season of life or yeah. season. Of the show? Hmm. Just keep going because it's going to end anyway. So just cause do you. Girl. <laughs> Life's going to end. So just just live. We all die. That's my mantra. Well, <laughs> me, and my, me and my friends, we have a mantra. It's called do it for Casey. 
Um, because years ago, were you a fan of Hawthorne Heights by any chance? They had the no. my heart is in no high. Well, they were on tour. One of their members, Casey, he died all of a sudden on the tour bus. And um, it wasn't like a favorite band of any of ours, but my friends were like, oh, it's sad. He was so young. And I, we were in Vegas when we found out. And I was like, no, guys, yeah, it's sad, but it's cool because he was out there just living what he wanted, living his dream, doing it. So we had this mantra, we do it for Casey. If you're like, I don't want to miss work for this concert, I'm like, do it for Casey. Life's too short. So I, do it for yes. Casey would probably be my biggest life mantra for any yeah. season. So you never know when it's going to end. So no. just do it. I love that. <laughs> awesome. That's a great note to end on. So share with us where we can find you on you Instagram to, or wherever else. Okay. Um, you can go to crushgasmpodcast.com and it has links to Twitter X. I'll call it Twitter because that's that's it's that's its government name, not this nickname X. And then um it's crushgasm pod on that, crushgasm podcast on Instagram. And you can find me on Facebook, everything. Anywhere you're listening to a podcast, you could probably find Crushgasm as awesome. well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kendra, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.